All right, so let's get into the ETF probability uh, case today. I think you guys are gonna like this one. We'll break down some things around, uh, of course, the win against the SEC from Grayscale, just off the heels there. And then also what this might mean for the rest of the ETF squad out there that is out there trying to get this done. We'll break all that down for you guys. It's gonna be a good one. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back into TechBath. Let's get into it today. Before we start, uh, I wanna thank our sponsor and that is iTrust Capital. If you guys are looking at long-term holding, this is one of the best plays places to do it. You can go into Bitcoin, ETH, also take a look at even precious metals over there. So there's a lot you can do with a crypto IRA by just going to the iTrust Capital website, click the link down below, make sure and use our link. It will give you a chance to get a $100 funding reward. So if you can do that, it helps the channel out and uh, hopefully you guys can look at uh, a crypto IRA. Let's get into a couple of news topics here. I want to go to the first story. Just in uh, US GDP, uh, GDP uh, data is announced. Here's some of the details. And also uh, the uh, reaction, I guess, from Bitcoin itself. Second quarter of the year, uh, US gross d domestic product, basically this is the growth of the country. Uh, data was announced today. And of course that came in at 2.1%. We thought we were gonna see a 2.4. So this was a little bit of a adjustment down. And I think this is one of those macro headwinds that continues to pace here in the United States. The real question is, are we gonna to continue to see more push from places and things like uh, CRE, et cetera, obviously a longer uh, cycle around interest rates, higher interest rates, all that is still playing into the macro picture. The ETFs will be the real question as to see whether or not we actually get market movement if and when an ETF, which I think it's when an ETF gets launched. Uh, but US GDP data is defined as a measure of total uh, value of goods and services produced by the US over a time a period. Most important indicators of companies' economic performance and prosperity. Everybody looks at GDP growth. Uh, we've shown this many times of not only us, but also China. And then if you can even compare this to the BRICS nations. Higher than expected data is to interpret as good for the U.S. dollar, while a lower than expected data is interpreting bad for the U.S. dollar. If you're following the Dixie, the DXY, you probably have already started to see that fall off here, obviously in wake of what we're seeing here around GDP. Other things that are going on is uh, interesting. This is uh, Ripple's chief legal officer saying that the SEC is getting battered in the court. Of course, this is just continuing to see loss after loss for the SEC. I'm still on the fence as to whether or not, and this was Stuart Alderati, who was the uh, uh, XRP attorney. SEC is getting battered in court. It's our case uh, has been proven wrong since called it hypocritical, lacking faithful allegiance to the law, fined for discovery abuses, et cetera. They're, they're doing a lot of things that are not right and they are getting slammed in the courts. This is, of course, I think showing uh, a very bad look for the SEC. It's something we've talked about here on the show quite a bit. But the real question is whether or not this is going to really cause the SEC to change their ways. And that is the question I think everybody's asking, because if they do change their ways and they come to an agreement, something, whether it's with BlackRock or others, to launch an ETF, maybe we are ending the cycle of this notion that the SEC is really against the crypto curious and the crypto crowd. But there's more news behind that. I want to go over to a first clip. And this one, of course, is John Deaton talking about why and how they've been losing. Listen in arbitrary and capricious. It is a very high standard. They only have to basically reasonably explain why they made the decision that they made. Even if the appellate judges disagree with the decision of the SEC, even if they think the SEC was using poor judgment in its decision, as long as the decision is one that can be reasonably explained in a coherent manner, then the SEC wins. Now, and that's the, that's the real question mark right now with the SEC is why were they not able to do that? I mean, this is a, a litigation powerhouse, or you would think. Why were they not able to be able to defend that out uh, within the Grayscale case? Is there something else happening? This is a, a continued question that I think a lot of people are asking. John Deaton also talked a little bit more about uh, the appeal process and what that might look like. Listen into what he had to say. I, I think I think the appeal was never really on the table because, uh, you know, in order for this to really be appealed, the SEC, Gary Gensler, would have to go to the Solicitor General of the United States and say, 
this is what the federal government should get really worked up about over the next 18 months. The worst case scenario for the Biden administration is that this ends up in front of the Supreme Court, though the entire administrative state, not just the SEC, but the EPA and pretty much every other administration that has regulations works underneath this umbrella of Chevron deference, which is an old Supreme Court case, which basically says, uh, you know, administrators can make rules and then enforce those rules. Do you want to die on this hill? And any solicitor general that reads that opinion and they look at the other decisions every single time the SEC is in court, they get their ass kicked in crypto. That's yeah, a they just lose. They just they lose. lose. Right. Yeah. All right. So this goes back to the whole point is, uh, is there another agenda here? Is there something else that's causing why would you do this? Why would you, as an SEC or even as a corporate strategist, there are some times where you intentionally go into a battle knowing that you're going to lose for the effect of another issue that may play out. And that's the real question mark here. I want to play a clip by uh, Grayscale and their chief uh, legal officer about the response to their win. This also kind of starts to set up some questions. Listen in. Can I just ask you straight up, do you see this as an approval? So yesterday is a big win, but it is, does not mean that GBTC will become an ETF today. Um, it's important to note there is still a 45-day process where the commission has time to review the decision and decide if they want to appeal. But then going back to the SEC, where they can you know, really have three decisions they can make. Approve GBTC as an ETF, which obviously we believe is a decision they should make with other spot Bitcoin ETFs. Uh, they could come up with another reason for denying spot Bitcoin ETFs, although unclear what that really would be given yesterday's outcome. And then thirdly, they could also undo the futures-based ETFs. Um, I think that's not the right decision either because that would really cause even more disruption and harm, potential harm to investors given that these products are trading out there with AUM and so on. We know about the trade fire giants like BlackRock and Fidelity, their applications for spot Bitcoin ETFs. Does the result uh, yesterday, does it change that timeline and your opinion on that timeline? Because you said you want it all to be, you know, given the go ahead in one go, uh, because anything else would be unfair. It's difficult to speculate on timelines. I'm really focused on GBTC. Of the other filers, we're the only one with an actual product. Is there any world in which you reach out to the SEC instead of the SEC reaching out to you in the next 45 days? There's prescribed channels for how we engage with any regulator. Um, you know, everybody knows that process. And so we really do have to first wait and honor this 45 day window, and then we can focus on reengaging with the commission. All right, so a 45 day window here, a lot could happen in those 45 days. So strategically, this could be maybe a win for Grayscale, maybe not. Depends if uh, BlackRock actually gets an approval. And we'll know something this Friday if we get another push or if we actually get an approval coming in. And I think there's a lot of people that have kind of pointed to the potential here. One thing that was kind of interesting around the Grayscale scenario, uh, this was Ryan Selkis. He says, basically, Bitcoin exposure boost 60, 40 portfolios 100% of the time, according to Bitwise, 100%. Uh, in any three-year period of the past decade, this is what the SEC is protecting investors from. So basically what they're saying is, in these last three years, we've continued to see investors win. So are they really protecting anyone from a gain, especially around the ETFs? And with this most recent lawsuit win, this could change the dynamics around it because the optics are clearly there. I want to jump over to another clip that is talking about Kathy Wood. And it's very interesting. You have to remember, this clip is coming from much earlier. She actually did this well before this lawsuit. Listen to what she had to say about Grayscale. I am. Re I really do believe that uh, the SEC is going to lose the Grayscale case, and that's going to happen pretty soon. And that one of the ways that the SEC could respond is to turn around and uh, change the subject and uh, approve not just one Bitcoin ETF, but a lot of the ones that are on the docket right now. The number of Bitcoin outstanding now is 19-ish million, and the maximum will be 21 million. If institutions want to move in, that's going to be a lot of incremental demand for not that much more incremental supply. So the only one to, the only way to, uh, to then do that is to bid the price up if they really want to be a part of that movement. 
All right, so you can see it there. Uh, this was August 23rd, so it is ahead of this ruling. And obviously, Kathy was dead on there, is that they would win the case, and it's going to change the dynamic here. This was an interview with uh, Michael, I think it's Sonnestein, uh, from Grayscale. And he said a few things in here. Obviously, they're talking about the fee structure. And if you guys aren't fully aware of the fee structure, I'll get to that in a second, because this is a big difference between how the trust currently operates versus what it would look like if it becomes an ETF. Listen to what they had to say. Will the charge 2% if it's an ETF? Well, we will certainly be lowering fees. You know, I've been on the show, discussed with Becky many times about our commitment to lowering fees uh, when GBTC does convert to an ETF. If you guys will have me back on, <laughs> I'll be here to talk about what GBTC's fee will be when the conversion does happen. But we have talked about it in the past. You mentioned legal fees were a real reason that they had to be so high. Are we talking about a halving of the fees? or what? Again, if you'll have me back, I'll be the first <laughs> to announce it here on Squawk Box what the new fee will be. All right, so as you can see, um, you have to remember that Grayscale is still one of the most profitable trusts out there. If you look at what Dylan Clare had to say about this, last point on GPTC for now, ignore what Grayscale says. Their interest in status quo, no ETF approvals, and continuing milking the 2% fee on top of that 600,000 Bitcoin that they, uh, they hold there. ETF approval would mean either they drop the fee 75% down to 0.5, half of a percent, and would potentially see maybe some massive outflows from the trust. Either way, th this could be a problem. Now, this is Dylan LeClaire. This is a Bitcoiner. This is, I would say, just something to be aware of. The question is to see really how Grayscale plays this out. Do they actually convert this over to an ETF? How does this play out across the market? Because there's going to be so much competition within the market. And you, you essentially would have to do it just to stay, I think, up with the Joneses, especially if BlackRock win BlackRock and 21 shares, et cetera, get, get launched here. Further into topics, uh, Bitcoin spot ETF experts say SEC has very little wiggle room now. I, I would agree with this. This is Eric Balkunas uh, talking about this coming in from Bloomberg. A couple of things they hit on new, Jeff Seifert uh, and I, uh, James Seifert, and I are upping the odds to 75% of the spot Bitcoin ETFs launching this year, 95% by the end of 24, so for sure. While we factored Grayscale's win into our previous 65% odds, the unanimity of the decisiveness of the ruling was way beyond expectations and leaves the SEC with very little wiggle room. So mainly it was the power in which the court said, come on, you got to be kidding me. This is clearly out of bounds. And it really put it into a position where they absolutely have no other choice. So my question to you is Friday's coming. It's one of the biggest dates out there for an ETF to potentially get approved. And there's multiples that could happen there, including remember that 21 shares, Kathy Woods ETF submission was pushed after, and timing wise, we've been talking about this with BlackRock and many others that are landing right here on the early September date. So the question is, will we see an ETF approval, a landslide going ahead, or will the SEC simply push this down and kick it down the road a little further? Love to get you guys' comments down below. Make sure and smash the like button because it's one of the ways that we get our message out there. And it's also how other people can learn more about what's happening in the digital asset market crypto in general, and also just in what we talk about here a lot within the Web3 ecosystem uh, around technology. This is Eleanor Tarrant coming in, new Grayscale CEO. Uh, Sana Shine says, today marks the day one in a 45-day process with the SEC uh, where they can't request a rehearing to challenge the DC Court of Appeals decision. So that's a process that will have to take place. Maybe the SEC comes back in and tries another uh, shot at it. That will be the question. What else could they bring to the table that they didn't already present in this original case? That'll be uh, one to watch for sure. Travis Kling comes in and says, Jock's position here is palpable, palpable in a uh, single day, SEC potentially approving a spot B Bitcoin ETF, uh, super TradFi, super institutional. Uh, all of this uh, definitely coming in. Now, it's interesting timing here. Let me zoom in out on this. Uh, obviously, between this court decision potentially paving the way for ETFs. And with that, you also have this situation occurring with Binance, where the SEC's secret Binance court filing now has everyone kind of look, look, looking at this and say, is there going to be some super bad news? Why were they sealing this filing? Because they never seal these kinds of documents. 
and or how is Binance responding? Because if Binance responds, does it mean, okay, we're gonna respond because we know we're innocent or if they don't respond? So that's the real question mark right now. All of this could continue to cause quite a bit of turmoil in the market. So a lot of that is starting to uh, shape up right now. Uh, here was a scoop coming in from Tarrett. She says, SEC Chair Gensler has agreed to testify for the banking GOP and the Senate banking on Tuesday. This is gonna come in the week after next on the 12th and before the Financials Committee and the Dems on Wednesday, the 27th. So this is gonna be a big month. We are gonna see uh, some fireworks, I think, on Capitol Hill. And this is, again, getting back into that political point that I always talk about. This is becoming a scenario where maybe Gensler is becoming political baggage. All right, so let's jump into one more article here. This gets into even a bigger potential win scenario and what it might affect, because this could affect a lot of different companies that now play into maybe even a bigger narrative than what we're seeing within the ETF. Follow along real quickly. Court sides with Uniswap over a class action lawsuit. Everybody's kind of seen this headline, but there's some very interesting points here I want to showcase. Class action complaint against Uniswap was tossed on Tuesday. It's out. Judge found that some of the claims were devoid of factual support due to protocol's decentralized nature. The identities of the scam token, that's the actual token that was brought into the, into the lawsuit, issuers are basically unknown and unknowable, leaving plaintiffs with an identifiable injury, but no identifiable defendant. Uh, further in the article, it says she added that the plaintiffs launch uh, the suit, hoping that the court might overlook the fact that the court uh, that the current state of cryptocurrency regulation leaves them without recourse, but that does not allow them to blame Uniswap for their injury. This is a huge, huge, maybe landslide uh, definition and possibly will set precedents across crypto communities, especially around decentralized scenarios that Uniswap play in. Now, you look at that, and then some other aspects that are in this, and I wanna kinda go back to this article real quick. Despite the claims that Uniswap is run as a for-profit business, FAIA, and I'll get to FAIA here in a second, said that there is no centralized ownership structure. The court finds that the smart contracts here were themselves able to be carried out lawfully as within the exchange of crypto commodities, ETH and Bitcoin, the ruling said. Now the name FAIA is interesting because that judge is also presiding over the Coinbase lawsuit. So very pro in understanding. And the good part of this is that Judge Faya, she understands what's happening here. Does this mean that we are looking at a potential absolute slam dunk on the Coinbase case? So all of that starts to play into SEC losing over here against Ripple, SEC losing another one against Grayscale. Now we've got a class action thrown out. Then you've got Coinbase being presided over by the same judge things start looking crazy. Oh, but that's not the end of the story. This is another factor into this. Robinhood also now added wallet support for Bitcoin Doge and Ethereum swaps. So taking a look at what happened here within everything else of what we're seeing within the Uniswap scenario, this starts to play into a very interesting uh, aspect of how Robinhood may start to really energize their whole crypto business. This is gonna open up a lot of opportunity for Robinhood. So that's another shoe to drop here. So it just continues to start to, to uh, bankroll against, I think, the current status of what's happening overall in the markets. And I think a lot of people who put crypto on the curbside are now reconsidering their situation. And if you don't think that that's the case, look at this tweet right here. This is Coinbase saying, we'll add support for PayPal USD. That's PayPal stablecoin. On Ethereum's network, that's an ERC-20. You guys have heard me talk about this quite a bit. This is a big deal for Ethereum. And then they're just telling everybody, don't, you know, obviously don't send your asset over other networks or your funds may be lost. That's a normal thing. Don't get scared if you're brand new to crypto. That's a normal thing. Coinbase and Coinbase Exchange and the regions where trading is supported, they're gonna add it. You can actually get to this within your Coinbase wallet, but they've got this in a couple of regions now and the likelihood of this launching here in the US, I think is very, very real. The other thing, this is Jamie Coates, who is the kind of the stablecoin czar over at Bloomberg. And he drops in a couple of things here. Stablecoins Eclipse MasterCard, PayPal leading the digital money evolution, a thread from today's note on Bloomberg Terminal, which looks at a representative data set of fiat backed stablecoins on the largest layer of layer one networks. And remember, we did full PayPal videos on this where we've talked 
talked about half a billion users and the average, I think the average amount that each user had was about $400. If you think about that just in a very, very small fractional percent that converts to a stable coin, if PayPal does any kind of incentive, whew, Ethereum is going to get very interesting with all of this. All right, hopefully this has given you guys a full rundown of what's happening. We'll continue to cover this. There's gonna be a lot of news this week and we're gonna have several interviews, very key interviews. Make sure and subscribe to the channel right now and hit that bell because that's gonna give you notifications when we, when we go live. I promise you we're gonna to try to get more live streams in. I know people are loving it. We'll get to those quickly as we can. Make sure and join the Diamond Circle. It's one of the best ways to get additional information, podcasts, additional analysis from me. And of course, some of our research all in the Diamond Circle. Just click that link down below. If you want to catch me, it's out there on Twitter at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechPath.